so this session would be like a primer for uh, asymmetric multiprocessing. Is there anyone here that has already experience on asymmetrical multiprocessing or work into that field? Zero? Okay. So um, I would be very like um, high level. Then I would be like supported by Laura, that's a colleague of mine. We work at Kinetics. Uh, we do embedded software, uh, especially in the Android space. So what we do is like heavily customize OS space on Android. Um, this is like our experience that we built on top of um, the asymmetric multiprocessing. And uh, let me start how we got like involved with asymmetric multiprocessing. Hi guys. <laughs> I'm glad that you came because I'm talking about this. Uh, so, um, we have been involved into an open source project called the WARP. Uh, the WARP was like a wearable reference platform based on IMX6. And because it was addressing the wearable market, uh, you know, we were like talking about, hey, how, how can we make wearables to do things like in order to save battery time? Because, you know, like if you have a full operating system on your watch, and because you want to display graphic, uh, power consumption is really heavily a driver for your life cycle. What we thought was interesting, and here we have the colleagues of Revolution Robotics that they developed the hardware for this community board. Um, we actually thought about an hybrid architecture. Hybrid architecture is really simple. We have like one board that has a microprocessor on it, and we have an interface that is like based on UART that goes into a daughter board that is featured in a microcontroller. Hybrid architecture means that we have two different operating system working on like, or bare metal code on the microcontroller. We use actually a K16 from uh, NXP and a full operating system on the uh, embedded board featuring the IMX6. We use the solo light. Uh, actually the board, the picture is there. It's a very tiny board. And uh, uh, the idea was to run like MCU driven tasks on the uh, dollar board, like a, a pedometer, right? You have a pedometer on the dollar board, you wanna gather data on the, uh, from the uh, dollar board and then is eventually send those data to the application processor for displaying if you have an app. Uh, this was like an old slide, a very high level slide to uh, how we handle software in an architecture like that. Basically, um, we invented something from scratch, right? And, and it was like pretty effective, but not really optimized. Uh, so this is actually based on a high level language like Java. So we thought about, okay, we, let's say that we have something written in Java and we wanna gather data from the pedometer. How can we handle that case? So basically we have sensor attached to the MCU, let's say like a pedometer, and then we have a code that like handling messages through a JSON, for example, um, um, streaming. So you serialize all the information to, uh, to JSON messages, and you send over UART, and the UART is connected to the SOC, and then you have the, your JVM and your, uh, I don't know, like, whatever library, right? Uh, in basically, because you are dealing with UR, you probably need another library, this uh, RXTX on top of it, in order for Java to handle data coming from the UR. As you can see, this is a, you know, like a very interesting solution, but when the IMX7, so when we have these little packages that are carrying both uh, microprocessor and uh, microcontroller on it, the use cases were like, pretty extended. We were not talking anymore like battery savings, like how can we build a wearable device which can have a more like uh, longevity in terms of uh, lifespan. Uh, but also, can we run software in two different area, completely segregated? So we have an MCU domain when we run our TOS or bare metal code. And then on the uh, CPU, we are running a full OS, can be Linux or Android. So uh, you probably are very familiar with the SMP. So SMP is a way for a single OS to deal with multi-core. 
So because every single core has a limitation in terms of uh, speed, right? The only way you can optimize the time and the, the performances is about splitting things. So your operating system is taking care about splitting all the tasks on, um, not tasks, but splitting uh, threads and, and such over multi-core, right? And then you have apps on top of that that doesn't know anything about this, but you gain in performances because you are splitting everything along your multi-core platform. A different things happens if you have like a, an asymmetrical uh, architecture. So asymmetrical means that you have different OSs that runs uh, on different cores. This is not really something new because if you're familiar with framework like uh, Mentor Graphics framework or Green Hill, they, they do those things like heavily in the automotive, on the aerospace, or uh, you know, flight control systems. So what happens if I have a deterministic software that has to run on a microcontroller, and then I have a completely different domain where I would say display something on the screen, and I don't want the two domains to be connected in order, for example, if I have a kernel panic, I don't actually panic what is, what is going on on the uh, RTOS or in the bare metal code. Uh, basically, how to deal with asymmetric processing is done through a special layer of API. So right now, you have two different operating systems, and these two operating systems, or, you know, like RTOS, because you may have, like, two different full OS running on different core, or you may have, like, uh, if you have, like, a... Um, uh, like a CPU, right, like a multi-core CPU. Or if you have a, in the same package a microcontroller, you can run RTOS or bare metal code. But how these two worlds actually communicate together. So we are here just to talk about exactly how to handle this communication that is driven by API, basically. So um, there is like a layer that does what is called the interprocessor communication. Um, the sweet thing is like it is a very segregated environment, so you can uh, really take advantage of having systems that they don't know anything about each other, other than what you want to communicate between each other. Uh, so always you may have different choices. Uh, one of the very basic difference between um, very mission critical system and like even if you are working with segregated environment not mission critical environments is the use of an hypervisor. Uh, again, if you go back to products like Mentor Graphics, they use an hypervisor to manage asymmetric multiprocessing. That means that the two CPU, they don't communicate each other directly. They go through an hypervisor that means that if something goes bad, is the hypervisor that takes care about a kernel panic, so I wanted to reboot eventually a guest operating system, and uh, the two CPU are completely disconnected each other, that, you know, so they don't, they don't have like a, a, a connection that is a direct connection between them. They are not sharing any interrupt, basically. So you have strong isolation in that case. Um, actually, you have very secure and robust system, but you add a, like a layer of software. Um, hypervisor in the embedded world, and probably there is people that knows more than me in that domain, they can be divided in different areas. Um, heavily in the, in the embedded world, um, monolithic hypervisor, so monolithic virtualization is heavily used. Monolithic uh, virtualization is what so the hypervisor is taking care of drivers, basically. When we install VMware in our Mac, we don't have, we don't need special drivers. We use the, the, the guest OS drivers, basically, to, to handle all the input output operation in the guest OS. But, you know, like, like Sen does like this. Uh, but in the embedded side, if you want a more, um, I would say, more performances, uh, you may want to have like a monolithic type of virtualization, that means that yes, you have to write your own driver for the hypervisor, but luckily uh, we were 
taking a look to some technology in that space, they share the same Linux header for the driver. So it's not so difficult to recompile if you have to recompile a driver that you want to share with your guest OS. On the other side, we have not supervised solutions. So and this is what we will see today. So you can have, you know, you can basically uh, have like a quite reliable system, not such the, the first one, but you know, quite, quite good anyway. So with not supervised, so not supervised or no virtualization, and you have the CPU that are actually sharing interrupts between each other when something happens and you want to share messages between the two. And we will see demo and examples in this specific case. One, what is very important about uh, what we would be seeing, uh, especially with, with Laura, uh, we'll be talking about details of what we, we will develop and what we discovered lately, uh, is, okay, how this inter-process communication actually works. Uh, basically, think about like an iso aussie layer type of thing. So when we have um, like a physical layer, right, like the TCP, oh sorry, like the, um, when we talk about networking, right, so we have like a physical layer that in this case is shared memory. And then you have like a, a media access control layer that is the layer number two, so the link layer, that in this case is done by Virt.io. Virt.io probably is, who is familiar with um, KVM? So with the para virtualization of KVM. Uh, Virt.io is what takes care about um, taking memory buffers and put in a queue that is like a, a, ring, a ring buffer, right? And the other core take those memory buffers from the queue and process it and send an interrupt when it's done. And then we have finally the transport layer uh, where the primary driver or device, you know, like, uh, so there is a driver and a device. It's called RP message. It's a framework. So basically, OpenAMP. I don't know if you guys are familiar with OpenAMP. OpenAMP is providing frameworks for lifecycle and message management between different cores in in an asymmetrical uh, architecture. Uh, RP message is built on top of VirtIO. Actually, is an API. So you have really API API driven in C. And is provided both for um, the RTOS and actually the Linux kernel already had VRTIO and RP message on mainstream kernel. But OpenAMP add the same features to bare metal and um, uh, real time operating system that was not available before. So they did like a they did like a a, a great job. Uh, so I guess that uh, now we will get into the specific things we have done with the IMX7, and uh, I call Laura that uh, we did like a, a recently a lot of work on the, the topic, and she will be presenting uh, the type of boards we have working on, which framework we used, which tool we use for debugging, and finally the demo that we did to show you how this interprocess communication actually works in practice. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Please welcome. It's the countdown. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. So, I will guide you to the steps that we took to develop an application on a hybrid system. Uh, we chose to develop on the NXP IMX7 uh, processor, which has a Cortex A7 core alongside a Cortex M4 core on, in the same SOC. Uh, we have a master-slave architecture where the Cortex-A7 is the master core and the M4 is the slave. This means that uh, the A7 is actually in charge of uh, loading the firmware and actually um, uh, release the Cortex-M4 from reset mode. So it takes, um, it, it is responsible for booting the M4. And from that point on, uh, they run completely independently <coughs> from each other and they actually run at different speeds. So we need an interprocessor communication protocol to uh, ensure that the two cores can communicate be between each other. And uh, the hardware module on the uh, IMX7 board that it is um, enabling this kind of communication is the messaging unit, 
while the software component that enables communication is the RP message component, which uses the OpenAMP framework. We will see a little bit uh, more in details of these components. Um, the two cores uh, in an asymmetric multiprocessing system actually uh, access the same peripherals and uh, memory areas, so we make sure that uh, we have a mechanism to avoid conflicts. Uh, we will go into details of this. So the RDC is the resource domain controller, and it's a hardware module of the IMX7 processor uh, that allows to create uh, isolated uh, resource domains. So basically, each peripheral or memory area can be assigned to one or more domain. Uh, here in the picture, you can see we have the application core, which has uh, which uses some this kind of uh, peripherals exclusively, and then you can have, of course, shared peripherals. So the RDC uh, makes sure that uh, resources, that access to shared resources is controlled and that there are no conflicts. Um, this is actually the component that, uh, the hardware component on the IMX7 processor that enables passing messages between the cores. So we basically have uh, a set of registers and interrupts. We have two sets of uh, matching register, one on each side, and we need two because uh, the two processor can um, work at different clock speeds, so we need a way to synchronize them when they're passing messages between each other. Uh, of course, you have interrupts to signal the other core when new data is available, and you have also uh, four general purpose interrupts on each side that you can use for general purpose signaling. We actually used in our demo application some of these general purpose interrupts, and we will see later how. So, uh, as Nicola said before, the um, software component that enables uh, communication, interprocessor communication, is RP RPMSG, and it sits on top of the Virtio bus. So, uh, this is a quick overview of, the, of how it's, um, Virtio is implemented in the RP message framework. Um, we have, um, in the Virtio implementation, we have uh, the Vring data structure, which has some Vring descriptors, which are uh, basically pointers to uh, shared buffer, buffers in memory, which represents our m message, our actual mac message. And the VirtQ that we see here on the left is uh, a user abstraction uh, that provides access to this Vring uh, structure and provides some APIs as well. So basically, our RP message component uses this VirtQ abstractions to send and receive messages uh, in the form of uh, buffers in shared memory. From the uh, higher level, from a higher level view, uh, we have the RP message component uh, design here. Um, each remote core in the RP message framework uh, is represented as a RP message device and provides a communication channel uh, through the uh, master core. So uh, the RP message device is also known as uh, a RP message channel, and it has uh, an, an ID, which is a textual name that is used to identify each RP message channel. It has a, a source address and a destination address. And on top of the RP message channel, we have logical endpoints that are provided by uh, we have a logical connection, sorry, on top of the RP message channels, which are provided by these endpoints that are represented here as these pipes. And each endpoint has a local address and a callback function associated to this address. So every time a new message arrives on the channel and has the destination address equal to the source address of the endpoint, the callback function is immediately uh, called and it can handle the payload of the message uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, currently in the RP message uh, implementation in Linux, uh, the channel is only dynamically created, so the remote service uh, sends a special message uh, to the RP message bus, which says, like, uh, I want to uh, instantiate a new channel. The RP message bus takes care of this message, creates the channel, and uh, from that point on, uh, an endpoint, a default endpoint is created, and communication can go on from this point. So uh, this is the actual implementation of the RP message component on Linux. 
Uh, the remote core is, of course, represented as a platform device, which stands on the platform bus. We have uh, this driver, which is the IMX RP G uh, custom platform driver, which takes care of this remote uh, platform device and registers a Virtio device. Then we have another driver, which is the Virtio RP message bus driver, which uh, is like a bridge from the Virtio bus to the RP message bus and registers an RP message device. Here we have uh, one last uh, custom driver, which is the RP message car driver, which was, is quite recent. It has been uh, introduced in the 4.11 kernel Linux version. And uh, of course it registers itself as an RP message driver. And as soon as it is uh, probed, it creates this character device here which represents our remote core. So it basically exports uh, the remote core abstraction as a character device, which is really useful if you have to uh, write like a new space application and have to deal with communication with this remote core. So uh, as soon as we have this device available, uh, the user space application can uh, do an IOCTL operation on this kind of uh, device and ask for and request the creation of an endpoint. Uh, as soon as this happens, another uh, character device is created which represents the endpoint, and it's this dev RP message X character device. And from this point on, user space has access to the uh, endpoint and can send and receive RP message messages just by writing and reading on the character device. So we developed a demo application on, uh, the IM, on an IMX7 baseboard, which is the boundary devices Nitrogen 7. Uh, we are actually replicating the same demo on a carrier board by Toradex with the IMX7 SOM. And the goal of our demo was to um, have uh, free Artos running on the Cortex M4 and Linux, uh, I think the version was 4.9, on the um, Cortex A7. Uh, so on the um, Cortex-M4 side, we are pulling an IMU, so an inertial measurement unit. Uh, we are reading data from the sensor and we want to send them to the master core and visualize them somehow. Um, one particular use case that we wanted to address was to uh, safely recover from a kernel panic on the uh, master core. Uh, we will see later all the details, but first uh, I wanted to uh, introduce you on how to um, build an environment uh, or prepare your environment for developing uh, a, an application on an AMP system. So the first thing you want to do is uh, bring up your remote core and of course you have to download the free Arto sources, the uh, GNU uh, GCC toolchain and you're pretty much ready to go because in the um, free Arto sources you have a subdirectory which is examples that has uh, a bunch of applications already ready to be built for uh, multiple boards. And you also have an ARM GCC subfolder where you have uh, build scripts. So you basically can just uh, launch those build scripts from shell and have your binary right away. Uh, second step is to actually uh, deploy the application on the Cortex-M4. You have uh, a couple of choices. Uh, I usually prefer to do it by, um, from U-Boot. So I use the uh, UBUS mass storage gadget to mount the EMC on my PC and I just drag and drop my binary. And then I use the M4 update UBoot command to actually deploy the application on the Cortex M4. Uh, you have a couple other choices. Uh, you can use also remote prop framework, which is still part of the OpenAMP framework and all documentation is under the OpenAMP documentation or you can use the M4 firmware loader from NXP. Uh, so uh, either of these methods will do the job. It basically depends on when you want your Cortex M4 to be started. Uh, then you can choose uh, from which memory you want to uh, run your application from. Uh, the preferred ver memory is usually the TCM, so the tightly coupled memory, because it's a small, um, fast uh, memory dedicated entirely to the Cortex M4. The drawback is that it's only 32 kilobytes, so you have to uh, make sure that your uh, free Arches application is uh, optimized to fit into this small size. 
So as I said before, you can uh, build your applications from shell very easily by using the build scripts. Uh, but you can choose, of course, to use an IDE. You have a couple of commercial choices. Uh, here I reported um, GS5 or Sorcery Codebench that they have like uh, a lot of tools especially uh, tailored for EMP debugging. Uh, I decided actually to go with the plain Eclipse way, so I just took uh, Eclipse and I equipped it with a few tools that can help debugging on, on AMT systems. Uh, I was using a J-Link uh, Sager debugger, so I needed like this set of tools, which, is, which are the uh, GNU MCU Eclipse plugins, to add support for my probe. Uh, then, of course, you, you will need GDB. Uh, if you're using, of, um, as well, um, J-Link debugger, you will need J-Link scripts to uh, debug both the Cortex-A7 core and the Cortex-M4 simultaneously. And then I use also the free Arches kernel awareness plugin from NXP, uh, which is not, it's the only thing that it's not open source, but it's really useful to um, debug uh, free Arches application. You can see like the status of your tasks, uh, stack usage, heap usage, and everything that's useful for this kind of debugging. So after you uh, set up your Eclipse, plain Eclipse uh, IDE, it should look like this. You have, of course, the classic breakpoints view. Uh, right now, I have only one breakpoint in the MCU, but of course, you can have multiple breakpoints on the MPU as well. You have your free Arches kernel awareness plugin for uh, debugging the tasks. And then, of course, you have uh, consoles uh, for debugging both the Cortex-M4 and the Cortex-A7 simultaneously. So back to our demo application that we developed. Uh, on the remote core, we have free Arches application. And we sample the uh, inertial measurement unit every 10 milliseconds. We calculate an objective function, in our case was uh, basically calculating the module of the vectors of the acceleration, accelerometer, magnetometer, and gyroscope data. Uh, then we're storing these samples on a buffer, uh, which is, in our case, is only uh, 300, uh, 300 elements. And uh, the reason that we use this queue, uh, this queue, this size of, for our queue, is that we wanted to uh, store our application on the TCM. So we only had like 32 kilobytes, so we have a pretty small buffer. But it's enough for the demo uh, we are studying. And then uh, items are um, dequeued from this buffer and sent to the master core for visualization. So we sent uh, 10 uh, items at a time uh, and every um, 100 milliseconds. On the master core, we have a much simpler application. It's a user space Linux application that just uh, pulls the character device, which represents the RP message endpoint, and dumps uh, the data received on a text file. So here we have uh, an overview of the, the architecture of the demo application. And on the left side, we, on the right side, sorry, we have the um, Cortex-M4, which is running FreeRTOS. And we have two asynchronous tasks. We have the emu polling task, which actually continuously uh, pulls the emu and enqueues our sam our samples in the share buffer. And then we have the data sender task, which is in charge for the initialization of the RP message channel. And it is in charge of um, dequeuing samples from the shared queue and sending it to the master core. Uh, here we can see uh, the RP message channel as well as the endpoints. And on the left side, we have uh, the Linux side, so our master core, which is running Linux. We can see the RP message car um, kernel um, driver, which uh, exports our endpoint data as uh, character devices. And finally, we have our user space application that interacts with the uh, character devices to read data and um, Dump, them, dump data on a text file. We also used uh, three general purpose interrupts that were provided by the messaging unit to actually signal uh, some states of the master to the remote core. Uh, these are all uh, triggered by the master towards the remote core. Uh, we call them start CMD, stop CMD, and heartbeat. So start CMD is an interrupt that it's used to signal that the master has created the endpoint and it's ready to receive data. 
Stop CMD is used to uh, signal that the endpoint has been destroyed, and this actually happens every time we close the RP message card client applications, since there's no need of keep receiving data if we're not using it. And the last one is the heartbeat. So we needed a way to, for the Cortex-M4 uh, to know whether the Cortex-A7 was uh, still up and running or if it crashed for some reason. So basically we're uh, generating an interrupt from the master periodically and the Cortex-M4 just checks uh, if this interrupt arrived at certain times and if it doesn't, it just assumes that the master is dead for some reason. So yes, this was uh, the previous image, and you can see we have the same, pretty much the same structure. Here we have the control flow on the two cores. So on the left side, we have RP message card client on the Linux, so the Linux um, user space application. We have a first transition from a state where the RP message channel is not created to a state where it's up. Uh, then the user application just uh, opens the dev RP message zero uh, character device, and with this action, the endpoint is actually created, and then we stay in this S2 state, which just keeps uh, re reading data incoming to the uh, RP message channel, and then when we want to close our application, we just uh, close the dev RP message zero character device, the endpoint is destroyed, um, and that's it. Uh, on the right side, we have the flow of the data sender task on the free Artos side. Uh, also here, we have a first transition from where the channel is not there to the um, state where the channel is created. Uh, then we just, uh, our task just waits for start CMD interrupt, uh, goes into this state where it just uh, keeps um, sending uh, the emu samples to the master core and checks for the master heartbeat. Uh, if uh, stop CMD uh, interrupt arrives, it just goes back to just um, reading samples from the EMU and buffering data. And if the master heartbeat doesn't arrive uh, on the expected time, it, the MCU just assumes that the MPU has crashed and goes back, destroys the channel and goes back to first state. So, uh, we had to figure out what to do if the Linux kernel panic on the master side. Um, using a watchdog uh, to just trigger a full reboot was not an option here, because in the IMX7 <coughs> architecture, if you reboot your um, Cortex-A7 core, also the M4 core will be rebooted. We still wanted the application to run, to keep running on the Cortex-M4 and just reboot the Linux kernel on the A7. So the solution we came up with was to use uh, KXAC, which allows to um, load a kernel from the currently running kernel. And the reason we chose KXAC is that it does not um, reset all the hardware devices, but it, it's just like a soft reboot. And so it doesn't actually touch our application running on the Cortex-M4. Uh, this mechanism is usually used in conjunction with KDump to also uh, dump the um, crushed kernel memory for further debugging. We actually didn't use KDump in this demo application. We only needed uh, KXAC. Uh, we also used two kernel images. One that uh, it is um, booted every time normally in a normal boot, and one that uh, it is uh, executed only in case of a kernel panic. So we had to add some extra um, options, both to the normal kernel command line and, and to the crash kernel command line. And then we had to use like this um, option to signal that the crash kernel has to be loaded only in case of a kernel panic occur. Uh, keep in mind that KXAC and KDAMP support on our platform is still experimental, so we had uh, some problems uh, with the demo. Uh, we solved some problems and we still have some other ones that we need to uh, have a more detailed look at. Uh, but we will see wh what are the problems that are still open in our demo. So we have a video of the demo. So 
So what we have is um, on the left side, we have the Cortex-A7, which is boot in Linux. And on the right side, we have uh, our Cortex-M4 with FreeRTOS. Uh, you can also see that uh, the FreeRTOS application has already started and has initialized the sensors. And it's actually uh, already sampling the EMU and buffering our data. So as soon as the Cortex-A7 is up, we just log in. And we launch our uh, RP message car client application, which is the user space application. And we can see that the data is starting to flow from the Cortex M4 to the Cortex A7. Uh, yeah, we are uh, writing our samples in a text file. You can see that data is correctly arriving on the master side. Then here we are uh, loading the crash kernel with the options that we saw earlier. And here we are actually causing a kernel panic. So here uh, you can see that the Cortex-M4 uh, said master is dead. So it actually realizes that the master core is not up anymore. And it just keeps running. And the Cortex-A7 uh, is uh, rebooting its crash kernel. So as soon as the uh, crash kernel is up and running, uh, the channel, the RP message channel is recreated again. And we can uh, relaunch our user space application to see that data is still uh, recovered. That's what we're doing here. So Cortex-M4 starts sending all the data that it has sampled and buffered to the Cortex-A7. And data is still arriving on the master side. So that's it. Uh, back to our presentation. Okay, so here are the problems that we encountered during the uh, development of this demo application. Uh, first of all, uh, before announcing the remote service, the remote core uh, actually checks whether the uh, master core is up or not. Uh, we saw that if this notification arrives too early in the booting process of the crash kernel, the system actually might hang. So we, uh, we did a kind of a workaround by adding a delay between the moment that the uh, remote core realizes that the master core is dead and uh, the moment where it tries to reinitiate the RP message channel. Uh, but we, don't, we didn't understand very well what the system hangs sometimes when this notification arrives too early. And the other problem, uh, which is a bigger one, <laughs> is that KXX still hangs sometimes, and it happens like randomly. It's really hard to debug, and, but we saw that it happens more frequently when uh, the flow of data is continuous from the remote core to the master core. So uh, I think that something's uh, wrong with the interrupts that are arriving, so if there are too many interrupts, the system might hang, but we, we will need to do some further investigation on this problem because it's uh, hard to debug and we didn't solve it on time. Uh, so that's it. If you have any questions. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> any questions? Yep. Uh, yes, actually, from the uh, on the remote core side, you use uh, RDC to actually um, say which peripherals and which memory areas are dedicated to the real-time core and which one are not. So they're completely independent and access to resources is um, safe. But you mentioned that the main core is going to interrupt the real-time core. Uh, yes. Uh, if the master decides to send interrupts to the... Uh, yes, uh, this is true. Uh, we need a way to make the uh, real-time core aware of the status of the uh, master core. Uh, also, I, we used the general purpose interrupts provided by the messaging unit, so I just assumed that it was kind of safe to send those kind of interrupts. This is why there are those three general purpose kind of interrupts. So we're gonna trust them. But your observation was absolutely 
Yeah, the messaging unit should uh, take care of this, actually. But. <laughs> yes. Is it? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Uh, no, it's just um, there is a packet structure, but it's only data written shared memory. It's not like a real packet. Yes. Can you talk a bit about the trade-off between putting the MCU from Ubuntu versus Linux? Why would you do one over the other? Uh, well, uh, it depends on when you want your um, Cortex M4 to be started, if you want it to be started before the Cortex A7, or if you want it to be started later. Uh, I didn't actually study performances, or uh, or I, I don't really know if there are differences on performances. I always used like the U-boot version yeah, method. Would, would you prefer to start the MCU immediately with uh, the, like a remote proc, use like another framework, another API provided by Open App, or do you take control of the M MPU when the, from the kernel? So let's say I want to keep the kernel first and then deploy the paper on the MCU after, and taking control and you know, provide or have provided the MCU from the kernel. Just decided to, for our purposes, to have just have our hands dirty if we want to take control of it and then start the MCU immediately to, to do manual reboot from it. That was just my approach. Uh, so I have a couple of quick questions. So on the open AMP front, since you said uh, you're using full open AMP as the example, is that everything, or do you use a little bit of No, we're using uh, uh, open AMP. I mean, FreeRTOS has the whole so open AMP middleware just. Ready. Okay. Yeah. And so the, the, the other side of that is, do you guys have anything on the table to say that that provides the work? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, we, we used the plain op open AMP implementation. Yes? Uh, no, I think it can actually work uh, with other, um, like if you have an Artos and another Artos. Uh, the OpenAMP implementation has um, a bunch of cases, use cases that you can use, and you can also use an FPGA. So um, there are multiple scenarios where you can use this framework, and it's all documented in the OpenAMP documentation. Uh, we didn't actually measure no. our throughput. No, we didn't. We didn't actually. Actually, Sorry. we traveled to have like the right frequency on the end use only, and we saw there was like a really big coupling between how fast I was sending and sending and being ready to send data to the core to the frequency we had like. So this is where the gray area is today, and we don't know if it is uh, because case is actually still experimental on ARM or not. But no, we were not measuring the improvement of performance on my CPU. Yes. Yep. Uh, I didn't actually understand all the questions. Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the RP message card driver use, uses um, socket buffers to store incoming data and export it to user space. Um, I don't know if that was. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 I guess that, I don't know if, 
No, it just uses uh, socket buffers. Instead of having a device like a character device. Yes. I, I guess that because you are using this DIO, as a, how you visualize the type of call, uh, I'm a bit bad at this. I don't know, like this DIO uses character device. So this is so like to share between uh, the KVM kernel and QM. Yes. Did you guys gather any performance data, like latency and what kind of data to get the We wanted to, but we, <laughs> we didn't actually because we had a hard time to like have all the system we can exact work. So we didn't make it on time, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, we, we do you mean like, uh, if I understand the question correctly, it's, uh, we didn't use a supervisor, right? So, because we didn't want to go through the hypervisor driving or requirement, so we are using like a force not in the mind. So, the question was how much effort? Also, like the um, in our case, we were using the boundary devices board. They already provide like a BSP for free artos and as well as um, uh, kernel sources, which everything is pretty much ready. Also, you boot sources, so everything is already taken care of. So the effort of just uh, deploying the kernel and the application, I mean, it's basically straightforward. We didn't actually have to. The, the more, most painful part was to set up actually the package things to work in debug stuff. For example, when we were experiencing the kernel panic from the from the from sorry, kernel panic and then started the crash kernel, the crash kernel sometimes doesn't boot, and we don't know why. So we start like try to debug the kernel stages, and it was like doing with all these uh, the JTAG and stuff that was probably the painful part of the entire experience with that. So having the right tool is probably having the right IDP is the most like time consuming uh, activity. Other than that, when you wrote the code for the uh, client use space on the Linux and you write your RTOS task, that is what you gotta write like from scratch. Other than that, everything is pretty much ready in the distribution of the RTOS from the vendor and from the Linux kernel, so it's ready to go. No, you can actually, uh, you have like different power states on the tool. Uh, you can also um, um, go to power save mode on the Cortex-A7 and just wake up 
the Cortex A7 as you want from the Cortex M4. So power uh, management from that point of view is independent. So yeah, you can do that. Yes. Start, you gotta start the MCU because actually the, the, the experience we had like, okay, what if the kernel panics, right? Okay, if I reboot everything, so I, I unplug the power, the MCU is dead. Right, and I know there's some other devices that have different architectures where no this. Power by no, this is controlled by the CPU. The CPU is the master. Yeah, we have one. The RPMS framework actually should be. Just one MCU. You can do the same stuff on a multi-core, installing multiple operating systems in the cores. That is possible for this to work on, yes. But the MX7 working with MCU, you have just one MCU. Anything else? Okay, thank you.